Anyway, so <laughs> Raw was this past week. It certainly was. It seems like only yesterday, but it was long ago. Janie, was she, she was the queen of my nights. They're in the darkness with the radio playing low. April the 18th, I would believe, was the day that it broadcast. And here came Monday Night Rollins. Was He was the Monday Night Messiah. Now he's Monday Night Rollins. He's hopping and he's hawing and he's gesticulating. And I, I honestly, at this point with his odd and jerky movements, in some cases he looks like Elaine Bennis trying to dance at a Christmas party. <laughs> And he's pointing and he's doing and he's bending over and he's changing the facial expressions. He looks like if if Kenny Olivier actually had testosterone and could grow, you know, hair and shit. So he invites Cody to the ring to come out and talk to him because obviously Cody beat Seth at WrestleMania and Cody's big re-debut. Seth wants a rematch. They're going to have a rematch. They're going to fight again at the next pay-per-view, if they're so mad at each other that they're going to fight again, why do they want to talk to each other in the ring with nobody in between them and they stand there for 15 minutes and never come to fisticuffs? Uh, this was kind of like, and I think Cody's going to do well because he's a walking thesaurus, but this is a WWE sports entertainment 20-minute dramatic presentation of a promo trying to get people interested in a pay-per-view match that actually at the end of it you want to see less than you did at the start because you've seen these guys stand there and mouth off at each other for 15 minutes and nobody did a goddamn thing and if they have a rematch cody can't lose so is seth just getting beat again did he get beat right before he got beat at wrestlemania he was on a losing streak before he was on a losing streak and it kept going and it ain't stopped. And this promo would never stop. They kept starting and stopping and milking the crowd. And you know, Cody was having fun cause they're cheering him, but I wrote God, this takes forever. And the bone of contention is that Cody, apparently according to Seth had an unfair advantage at WrestleMania because he didn't know who he was facing, but Cody did. So that's why they're going to have the rematch. And Seth says, I do everything better than you. I do this. I, I drips the drop better than you. So Seth talked to Cody for about five straight minutes. And then Cody talked back to Seth like he was running for public office. And then finally, Seth has picked a surprise opponent for Cody for tonight so he can get a little taste of his own medicine. And Cody accepted it. And it was... Over 15 minutes to get to that point. <sighs> I like uh, guys doing interviews to set up their matches, but at it, it just there's no there's no host, there's no announcer. There's just these two guys who it is now accepted on this program that any talent can just walk out and take over the show at any point with their own microphone. Nobody's running this thing. I mean, that's that horse has already left the barn, but they just talk and talk and talk, and the only time they stop talking is when they're milking the people to cheer so they're not talking. It was long, is what I'm saying. We on the drive through talked about Cody and WWE, and you had an email about someone saying that the fans there were going to get sick of him, and I disagreed with it, and I had seen Raw at that time, and you hadn't. And I said, the problem isn't as much Cody as the way they're using him, which is the way they use everyone else, which is you come there, you're special. Now we're going to jam you down everyone's throat. They're jamming him down the throat by him being in there for 20 minutes talking and he's going to still come out. He's going to get his entrance twice on the same show. Yeah. Which loses its specialness. If we pop big for you the first time, we're going to do the same the second time. I think that's the problem is Cody has, he has a lot going for him right now, but they also have to use him well to make it work. Well, and see, that's the th in again in in this company twenty years ago. You could bring a main event guy in and put him on TV every week, but he wasn't he wasn't doing a five minute entrance twice, and he wasn't doing a fifteen minute long promo, and then having a main event competitive match right when he first got to the company. 
He was having interviews that were of the length that interviews used to be before they got writers, so they didn't wear out their welcome if they were any good. And there was plenty of talent on the roster, so you got a six- or eight-minute match to showcase what you could do and get a good win as you were being built up to uh, face more top guys in main event style matches. It wasn't the, as you said, the incessantness of every show multiple times seeing the same guy doing a lot of the same stuff. And, but now the, the talent is so thin, sparse, that they have to put guys in these long matches, whether they need to be long or not. The the entrances, because it's a three-hour program, are just out of fucking control, just out of hand. And you're seeing these top guys for 30 minutes and more each week, and that would almost wear anybody out. So, I mean, that... <laughs> The problem is not Cody or even what Cody's doing. The problem is how much of of it he's going to do. And we're going to see, I think. Uh, but um, that was the first 15, 20, well, 20 minutes of the show after we saw the package, and they do great packages. I'm not saying don't do the package. But then, thankfully, we had a break in the action. <laughs> and the next match was Naomi and Sasha against Rhea Ripley and Liv, Liv Morgan. Leave Morgan. Well, that's what she told her to do. Leave, Morgan. Naomi and Sasha double-teamed and beat Rhea Ripley. Liv was nowhere innocently, but she had been taken out of the picture. I'm not happy they beat Rhea Ripley again, but since it leads to this, if she's going to be a single heel, I'll take it, I'll take it. She gets pissed. She and little, little Liv have an argument. And Ripley jumped her and beat the shit out of her and gave her the riptide. And that was a great 30 seconds. If now we can have Rhea Ripley as a single heel being moved into the main event mix with the, the Charlottes and the Rouseys and the Biancas and the Beckys, that would be a wonderful thing. Otherwise, I didn't, uh, I spaced on the match. What'd you think? It is what it is, but my bigger question is, what do you think in a perfect world, and if we could take all the booking of the last couple of years out of the equation, in a perfect world, what is the best use of Rhea Ripley right now, as a heel or as a babyface? Right now, I think she needs to be a heel, because she's been out there, she has that look, and she can be dominant physically, because she's bigger than most of the rest of the girls, and she sh can show her strength with the moves she does. Uh, you know, she's got such a great look and a great smile and et cetera when she wants to do that, that if they'd have pushed her at the start as a baby face, I think it's it's a great thing to have, you know, as she's an action movie. Somebody again said, oh, Cornette thinks she's a movie star. Once again, not like Marilyn Monroe, like fucking goddamn Bruce Willis, The Rock. She's an action movie star. And that would have been great as a babyface. Now that she's teamed with flunkies, the thing with Nikki ass, let her be a heel. Let her fuck some people up. Let her beat some people and jerk them around and show her dominant physicality. And then later on, as she hopefully will get established with a fresh push, then they could get behind her as people do top talent being used as top talent. But let's try this, since at least it's different than what they've done before. Speaking of who needs to be a heel or a baby face, good God almighty, did you see the lie detector test? Yeah, yeah, I saw. This was one of the more embarrassing segments I've seen in a while. There was no baby face or heel in this. They're all heels, including the people that wrote it and anybody that fucking held the camera on it and made us watch it. The Kevin Owens show, the KO show with Chad Gable, who I liked as an athlete in that team with Jordan, and then they made him shorty, and now they've made him an idiot, and I can't wait to not see him on my television. 
And they gave a lie detector test to Elias slash Ezekiel because, of course, Owens has been flipping out that it's really Elias because, of course, it's obviously Elias, but he claims he's Ezekiel, his younger brother or whatever. And Owens is the only one. He's Oliver Wendell Douglas on a set of Green Acres. He's the only one that sees the chaos and the craziness that's going on. And it's driving him to distraction. He's losing his religion over this. So they set up a lie detector test, and Gable is administering the lie detector test because <laughs> he's an expert because he went to college and lettered in wrestling or whatever the fuck. And they've got the graph, the lie detector test, the needle, the graph that moves back and forth, they've got that on the Titan Tron. And Gable is shooshing the people. And he and Owens are trying to do comedy. Owens has apparently paid him $150 Canadian money to do this, so do it right. And they bring out Ezekiel, or Elias, who looks... Now he looks like 1982 baby... 1980 babyface Paul Ellering, doesn't he? You know what? Wow, that's really good. He does look like that, yeah. He just looks fucking weird is what he looks like. It, it, that Once we've seen him the way he used to look, he don't look right anymore. But anyway, they give him the test. He says his real name is Ezekiel, and it says he's telling the truth. Is Elias your older brother? He says, yes, he's telling the truth. Is Elias your real name? No, he's telling the truth. What the fuck? So how are they? It was unbearable, except for Owens calling Buffalo, New York, Canada's landfill. That was a bright spot, but otherwise. Can you imagine... What Kevin Steen's reaction would have been if me or Delirious or anybody in Ring of Honor had asked him to go out there and do this with all how he was all against cheesy and old school and old style and bad comedy booking, whatever the fuck. I can tell you how we, I mean, <sighs> the problem is you and Delirious and whoever wouldn't have presented it the right way. WWE learned the right way to present these segments, which is, here's a whole shitload of money, do all this stuff that violates your integrity. Well, now you've, you've hit straight to the meat of the matter. So after this unbearable thing, basically Owens gets up in Elias Ezekiel's or Ezekiel Elias's face. Ezekiel Elias, that's what his name is. And he got up in his face, and they had words, and Kevin Owens or elsed him like he did last week or whatever. Well, you got the count of five, or you got to get out of my ring or else, and then Owens is the one that leaves. And Gable attacks from behind. And they have a match which I didn't watch because, God, did the lie detector, we ought to look at the minute-by-minute -minute ratings later on and see if the lie detector test caused a significant viewer exodus from this program because this was just brutal it wasn't funny it wasn't done well it was it's like people jacking off out there right it was like over the top childish acting we always joke about oh this belongs on nickelodeon or disney channel that's what chad gable's acting was in this kevin owens is getting even more over the top in the cartoony wwe fashion lately it seems He's having a good time, obviously, and he's good at delivering their garbage. But you watch something like this, and the big takeaway for me is, who is the audience for this? Because it's not especially entertaining. It's not especially funny. It seems like it's being delivered to a young audience, but we know, based on facts, that there isn't really a big young audience for Raw. It's a much older audience. Wait a minute, you're basing things on facts? an audience that wouldn't really want to see something like this, it makes no sense why something this bad gets on a wrestling show. This was an atrocious segment. But again, they have people who like the stupidity of wrestling and they like the Elias. You know, they, there are people like the Otis-Mandy relationship and those are the same people that are going to like the Elias-Ezekiel crap. Well, next up, Deja Vu. Wouldn't you like the match that we showed you times 22? <laughs> RK Bro 
versus the Street Profits, number 743. I skipped that, too, because uh, I... If Randy Orton ever starts having singles matches again that don't involve setting anybody on fire, I'd like to see him. But otherwise, to have to watch Riddle and look at the the uh, great great value private party here. You know what, though? I watched some of this match, a good portion of it, in fact. If you can, the next time you see RK Bro in a, I was about to say one-on-one, a two-on-two tag team match, a traditional tag team match, they were working pretty good together, Orton and Riddle, as a tag team. I thought to myself, I'd really like to hear what Jim thinks of this, but I know he's going to skip it, <laughs> and I don't blame him, but next is time... There a, is there a good tag team they could wrestle instead of the same guys every fucking week, or is this just what we're going to have? AEW has endless tag teams, and WWE has like the same four tag teams in constant rotation always. And AEW, we can't get the rematches we want of the matches that were good. And in the WWE, we have constant rematches of matches we didn't really care about the first time. Okay, I'm just glad we got that straight. Do birds still fly out of Riddle's ass? When I said I saw most of it, I missed the bird <laughs> part of the match at the beginning. The bird, well, you know about the colon delivery works for the birds, too. You know, honestly, if you're watching wrestling and you watch it every week, what incentive is there not to either fast forward or change the channel during a ring introduction? Because you see it nonstop and you know they take forever. So I didn't see the birds because I usually am ignoring things during the introductions. Well, they're going to switch it up one of these days. They're going to have some other fucking creature come out of his ass just to see if anybody's paying attention. Gerbils? The birds attack him. They come out of his ass and just attack him. <laughs> and peck his little head to death. Okay, well, next up on Raw was a promo with Edge and Damian Priest doing the House of Black's gimmick better than the House of Black do it. Um, You've got spooky-looking guys in black suits, a leader and a follower. The follower has a reason to be have a bad attitude toward the way he's been treated after he's been swayed in that direction by the leader, who also has a reason to be pissed at the company because... As Edge mentioned, Damien Pl Damien Pleased. Damien Priest played second fiddle to Bugs Bunny at last year's WrestleMania, and Edge came back and overcame his retirement, neck injury, the whole nine yards. And he's, as he says, the people end up, they don't appreciate him. Classic heel stuff. You got to think that you're right and that you do have a legitimate gripe, even though you're deranged. And Edge did a great promo here, not only with emotion and facials and inflection and the delivery, but it was shot well. It wasn't a black closet with a lava lamp where somebody walks into a spotlight and finishes somebody else's sentence. It, it, the House of Black promos on AEW now look like the fucking, you know, the foreheads in Bohemian Rhapsody, but they've missed one. It's just they're in the fucking dark somewhere with a flashlight shining on them. This looked like what they're trying to do. They just did it better. What do you think? It's a little too schlocky for me. I don't like this kind of stuff on my wrestling. I do think it works a little better than the House of Black, but we'll talk more about that with AEW's review. The only good thing I can really say about this is at least... As stupid as I find this, Damian Priest is standing out a little bit more being a part of it. And he kind of yeah. looks the role, you know, in the black outfit with the black background and the deep voice. This may be a way to get him somewhere after all this ends. So in that way, I think it's all right. But that's really the only benefit to me I see is that Damian Priest stands out a little bit more. You know, that's another test. They, ought to, they talk about, well, we're only going to sign people that are such and such height and such and such weight. They ought to have a tone meter and only sign people with grown up adult male voices that sound like some instead of I'm going to kick the shit out of you me so speaking of which shortly after this AJ Styles is in the locker room <laughs> about to talk to interviewer number 14 and suddenly the lights flicker on and off 
And then Edge and Damian Priest just appear next to him in the shaded light and kick the shit out of him. And I liked this promo that preceded it, and I like it so much less after seeing this because now they're just like everything else. They're fake as fuck. Even if they had somebody on the light switch and what anybody that's been in a fucking major arena knows to be a locker room, it's probably 20 feet square. But they then suddenly colored lights that had to be specially installed come on, and AJ had no idea that these two guys were going to be standing next to him until he saw him standing next to him. They just had the talent go out and talk and look professional and look like the gimmick, look like something. And then they do a bunch of fake, phony wrestling shit that people who wanted to parody wrestling 40 years ago would have done on a sketch comedy show. So, tip of the cap, wag of the finger. That's right. You know, I'm not exactly sure when, but I'm going to play spoiler here. I missed the end of Raw because I was getting tired. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long show, and I ended up falling asleep. I went to the couch in the library and laid down for five minutes with Swami and fell asleep. No, no, yeah, I know exactly what you did. You're trying to say that you were up and about and yeah. that you were working and watching this show, and suddenly, yep. you just had to go and take a nap. You were so tired. No, what it was was the combination of the raw tonins that seep into your brain through your eyeballs whenever you watch Raw, and the fact that you were laying in a comfortable position on your Helix mattress. That's what contributed to you zoning out, conking out, and going to the land of somnambulism and missing the rest of this paint-drying program. You made the mistake of trying to watch a boring program on a Helix sleep mattress, and everybody knows that's no good. Folks, you could watch back-to-back -back director's cuts of Deep Throat and Behind the Green Door, and you could still fall asleep during those on a Helix sleep mattress. They're so comfortable. You could be watching footage of Freddy fucking a football. It doesn't what? matter. Can we get away from some of these films that you're naming and get into more well, mainstream films? That was that was a that was actually a sequel to Dumbo Does It Donkey Style. But no matter what kind of excitement you're involved in or you're watching, you're gonna go to sleep on the Helix mattress. You gotta be careful. You don't wanna just sit down to answer the phone. Even if you sit on one of these Helix mattresses, you'll be unconscious instantly. It has to do with a a, a pouch of gas that's stored secretly in the middle of the mattress. That once you sit down on it and it unleashes some of that, you get a good whiff. You're out like James West in the Wild Wild West when he's fucking around with Dr. Miguelito Loveless. However, you can get non-gas filled mattresses also if you want to do it the normal way, the natural way. What you do is you go to Helix, H-E-L-I-X, helixsleep.com and you take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they will match you to a customized mattress that gives you the best sleep of your life. You will never, you'll want to sleep like you're in suspended animation. If you wake up and Buck Rogers is leaning down looking at you, you've gone too far. Folks, they got a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. I've seen sometimes they get so upset they drag it out in your front yard and set fire to it right in front of you. They're upset that they created a mattress that you wouldn't like, and, and then they'll go and they'll beat themselves with chains across the back. The, the Helix delivery people, if you don't like their mattress, they want to punish themselves, folks, because they want to make shit that you love. But anyway, if you go to helixsleep.com slash jce, Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Just for our listeners, helixsleep.com slash JCE, up to $200 off mattress orders and two free pillows. And remember to specify whether you want the bag of sleep gas placed in the middle of your mattress or whether you want to go it alone. Either way, it's going to be comfortable. But, uh... Especially if you have any issues, if you get the sleep gas, then you're probably going to be out for six months or so. Things will be better by then. Sleep gas? Well, they have the pouch of it right in the middle of the mattress. That's optional, though. And it costs a lot more. 
You know I'm under the weather. I can't fight you the way I normally would. This is so I unfair. I can't fight you. I can't fight so unfair. All right, just get the mattresses without pouches of sleep gas. That's right. They're no safe. No skin off my nose. They'll no, and there'll be no skin off your body because these mattresses are safe and they are, I was about to say delicious, not delicious, but comfortable. No. You will like them. Do not eat the mattresses. No. And they do sometimes have, you got to inspect them like Halloween candy. Sometimes people put safety pins and razor no, blades No, see, in. stop. There you go again. There are no safety pins. There are no razors. This is not an apple in 1976 during Halloween. This is a fine, safe, and comfortable mattress because that's the only kind of mattress we would ever talk about. He'll sleep. I could have said it better myself. Well, up next, we'll forget about the gas bags until later when we get AEW. There and then there's plenty no of gas, gas bags. On. Well, there's there. plenty of gas yeah. bags on AEW. That's true. But the next match on Raw was for the U.S. title. Austin, I'm sorry, Theory, because he's unproven. As soon as he is, they'll change his name to Fact. Versus Balor for the U.S. title. They have already had five matches. Have they not? Do they not wrestle every week, either in singles or in multi, in six man or whatever the fuck? I've seen Theory beat Balor. I've seen Balor beat Theory. These are not massively disputed finishes that call for immediate rematches. This is not a blood feud. They just don't have anybody else to wrestle, and they wanted to put the belt on our boy Theory. So they had a bit of a match and went to the break. They came back and did some, some of the same stuff they usually do. This was not the best one, nor I don't know the worst one that I've seen. Theory did a nice leaping, flipping something off the top rope. And then Balor missed his stomp off the top and Theory hit his finish, one, two, three, and they got a new United States champion in, I don't know, this took 10 minutes with the break. And then all the mid-card guys hit the ring to celebrate a heel winning a title and they pick him up on on their shoulders and then here comes Vince out to the entranceway with his music and old theory goes up to Vince and takes selfies with Vince in the belt. I don't know that this was exactly the career making moment of making this guy a big time champion or whether it was a TV match with a belt involved and a bunch of preliminary guys who just wanted to be on the show were the ones that were happy about it. But you went to sleep, didn't you? Well, you know, I did catch some of this because some of it rings uh, true. I remember <laughs> a <laughs> bit of it. True? But this was the Sounds like you've had your bell rung more than one time here lately. Hey, listen, Sudafed, marijuana, caffeine, it's all happening right now inside this body. But what I was going to say is this is the first time you've seen Austin Theory, unless I'm wrong, since he had his name changed to Theory. We hear the reports. It sounds stupid. What do you think when you actually hear him announced as theory and called that throughout the match. It's as stupid as the reports. And again, somebody is now they brought up, well, what about edge and Goldberg and Christian? His name wasn't Matthew edge. <laughs> it was just edge. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was never two things to begin with. And then suddenly dropped it. And also none of those names beg for a question mark at the end of them. But when you theory, yeah. You slept through the title change. Shame on you. Hopefully you slept through the wedding ceremony. This was so repugnant that it almost made me skip the main event and just say, I'm done. But you know what? The double wedding ceremony. I saw the wedding ceremony. I didn't fall oh, asleep so yet. Yeah. I can't remember when I fell asleep. I know I fell asleep in the middle of Raw. I just can't remember the exact point. But every time you bring up another well, one getting, of these things. We're getting to the end. So it just, you were just so, thought they you were, were hypnotized. I thought they were nightmares. I thought I was sleeping and they were nightmares. Yes. <laughs> Fever dreams. <laughs> the double wedding ceremony. Ron Killings is the preacher. Our truth is the preacher. And four people are going to get married. Or I think they said commitment ceremony. It's all bullshit. Reggie and Dana and Tamina and Tazawa. Where what happened to Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice? For all you 60-year-olds in the audience, that'll be fucking hilarious. 
And obviously this whole clown show was phony as a football bat and built up to where they all beat each other. The women in the wedding gowns and the the guys in the tuxedo, whatever, they all beat each other for the 24-7 comedy title that's fucking ludicrous. And they wonder why they're losing viewers. 13 minutes of national TV time looked like cable access. And I use your line. Who is the audience for this? Stupid people? Why would anybody have chosen of their own free will to watch these underneath talents pretend to do shit that we know obviously they're not doing and not do it well and it's not funny? It's just silly and stupid. I would say I'd never watch any of these people again, but I would never watch them before. Did you go back to sleep yet? I will say I think it was the best I've ever seen Tamina. I what? We, I, I've never found her entertaining or particularly good, but she was the highlight of this, but it was terrible. Definitely made me miss the seriousness of the lie detector segment. <laughs> but again, you, you kind of hit on my thing. What is the audience for this? Who is the audience for this? They're not even... And I'm not saying you should do this with main event people because it would be a, a malpractice. It'd be even Porter worse. Yeah. yeah. But who cares about the lower card, mid card people doing a bullshit, clearly fake, stupid wedding on this show? And it took forever. This show takes forever. This show is garbage almost every week. Terrible. If you're lucky, you get one good segment. If you're lucky. What garbage? This was approved. Someone pitched the idea of the wedding. Someone came up with all the little bad comedy segments. And it was approved. And it got on the air. And again, at what point in Vince McMahon's life did he say, I just want to always see adults act like children? Because no one acts like any of this. I just want one wrestling show with adults who act like adults. Well, we get that somewhat with AEW sometimes, but it's never on this show. I'll go back to sleep. That's the rating I give the wedding. Hopefully, um, from the looks of the relationship between some of these couples, the gifts are returnable. So we come to our main event of the evening. Cody Rhodes versus a mystery opponent picked by Seth Rollins. Another entrance. So now they've done a 15-minute promo earlier in the show, plus the opening package. And they got 20 minutes left on the air, so they're going to have a 20-minute main event. If we talked about wearing welcomes out. So here comes Seth again, big, uh, you know, the big entrance, the suit, the music, the whole nine yards, and he does a big introduction of Kevin Owens, the same guy that just did a 15-minute comedy lie detector segment <laughs> and threatened somebody or else and then walked off on them now they don't have enough talent for three hours so the guy that keeps her elsing and walking off is about to do a, a job of some description here in an unrelated angle because they don't have enough guys it really is sometimes like raw is the old promotion where the weather's bad or guys couldn't make it there. Yeah. It's just a small house show where you have like a tag team match and then two singles matches featuring the tag team wrestlers and then everything else featuring the same wrestlers over and over. That famous Knoxville TV that still exists, uh, thanks to golden boy Joe Kazana, it was fucking snow in East Tennessee and none of the guys could get to TV. Ron Wright was there because he lived there and Ron Wright could get anywhere. And... The other rest of the hour of the show was Jerry Lawler and Jim White having two singles matches against Tommy Gilbert because Tommy Gilbert's partner wasn't there. And and they did the interview angle with Ron Wright, and that was the fucking show. That used to happen a lot in the old days when the card wouldn't be that huge to begin with, and you were supposed to be at the studio for TV an hour before the show went on the air live. So shit happened. But anyway... Um, they did two minutes of the match with Cody and Owens and Cody did a dive and Owens racked him into the rail and they went to the break and they came back from the break. And I noticed this. I don't know if you were back snoozing, but I was done. Yeah, I was done. Okay. Well, they were going through all the motions of having a match, but just that 
I mean, they're palming guys' heads and flinging them through the ropes, and they're going. And it's a pace, but it's not aggressive. It's it's in kind of an an uninspired spot show match. And I could imagine that Owens was probably tired from being out there for 15 minutes of lie detecting and whatever, but it just, he got some heat on Cody. Owens goes to the top. Owens did a senton, you know, the flipping thing where they land with the back like Jeff Hardy's doing potato and people now, right? Yeah. He did a senton. Cody raises the knees, but Owens landed on Cody's knees for real, right top. He could have blown both his PCLs. He squashed him up like a fucking accordion. And then they took a bump over the desk. After they, they go out on the floor, they're fighting on the floor, they take a bump over the desk, and suddenly Seth Rollins' music starts playing, and out he comes, and they go to another commercial. Now there's eight minutes left on the air in the main event, and they've just gone to a break. Talk about breaking up momentum. And the, the tease to, to keep us after the break is Seth's coming. What's he going to do? Well, guess what? When fucking, when they come back, they're just wrestling. Seth's not a fucking participant or an entity. He's just hanging around. He didn't do anything. So Owens hits a splash off the top, gets a two count. And another lead-assed swanton gets two count and cody starts making a comeback finally but he gets power bombed for another two count and then owens goes to the top again and cody gets up and fucking some way he's trying to they're doing the thing on the turnbuckles and some way Owens gives Cody a fisherman suplex off the top rope and Cody gets his foot on the ropes. And then I wrote, Jesus, where's the cannon? And then Cody backdrops Owens onto the apron. He takes the full bump on the apron hard and rolls off on the floor. And Seth Rollins is telling him, get your fat ass back in there and do something. And the referee's counting him out. And at nine, Owens tells Rollins, well, it's your stupid match. And waves him off and walks off again. <laughs> That's the, They ought to start. Kevin Owens has music to come out on his entrance. And then every time he leaves, they play the walkaway music from The Incredible Hulk. Do, 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 do. So he walks out. At, as the referee is at nine, he's waved Rollins off and my DVR froze because they were that close to the end of the show. So apparently, Owens took a walk and got counted out. Cody won, and this took a long, long time to do. What were you dreaming about at this point? How lucky I was not to be watching WWE. It's a rotten show. It's terrible. You're surprised when it's good. You're not surprised when it's bad, because bad is typical. Well, see, that's what lowered expectations. They get you thinking, yeah, I'm going to watch this show and it's going to suck pond water. And then they throw one good thing in and you're just over the fucking moon. But unfortunately, folks, you know, because Brian has been feeling puny and he did nod off because this raw ranks right up there with hypnosis as a great way to go to sleep. But... If you neither want to subject yourself to three hours of Raw, nor hire your own hypnotist, then you know how the best way to get to sleep is, and how most people get to sleep is these days, and that's with the incredible powder from Beam called Beam Dream. And Brian, of course, you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity. And sleeping less than six to seven hours a night is linked to reduced white blood cell count, which, of course, the white blood cells are what protect our body against illness and diseases, virus, bacteria, germs, russos. The white blood cells are our first line of defense, so having a consistent nighttime routine is so important. A better tomorrow starts tonight, or if you want to get an early start, this afternoon. Introducing Beam Dream. That's what's being brought into this conversation. It's the world's most innovative functional wellness brand is Beam with unique products 
for everything to make you sleep, to make you recover. And boy, sleeping's one thing, but recovering from sleep, that's even harder. <clears throat> but right now, folks, today, you're going to get a special discount for the Dream Powder, Beam's best-selling healthy hot cocoa, which contains natural sleep-promoting premium ingredients, triple lab-tested. I don't know what that damn Labrador has to do with this thing. He sleeps in a corner on his bed all the time anyway. But he's tested it three times. There's no THC in this, but still get it. And 98% of people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream. 99% of people experience better sleep quality. And 1% wake up having vivid memories of a previous life. You just mix the Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir, and enjoy 30 minutes before bedtime or... If you want to operate some heavy machinery, drink a double dose about an hour beforehand. Folks, you can find out. Drink a regular Forbes. dose the regular way, as recommended by Beam. Yes, yes, you can find out why Forbes and the New York Times are all talking about Beam and how they're reporting on the people that are slowly coming back to consciousness and can't wait to try it again. And if you don't love it, you'll get your money back, guaranteed. Actually, they'll tell you they sent you your money. You'll be so confused when you wake up, you won't really know the difference, and you'll forget about it after a while because there are short-term memory issues. However, for a limited time only, you can get $20 off when you go to Beam, that's B-E-A-M, beamorganics.com slash J-C-E, use the code J-C-E at checkout. Beamorganics.com slash J-C-E and use the code J-C-E for $20 off. You will sleep like you are a member of the Transylvanian Undead with Beam. That's right, but we will be alive with Beam, and you will feel alive when you wake up from Beam. And hopefully <laughs> I'll have some Beam after this show, because I could really use some. You need, you need some, uh, some Beam or some Dream or some Steam or something to you. Uh, as a matter of fact, what is keeping the folks awake over there in the Arcadian Vanguard... Uh, division here this this fine week oh sinuses are not another great fucking week on the arcadian vanguard podcast network get information about all the shows on twitter at super podcast or on facebook facebook.com slash arcadian vanguard a few notes the latest episode of the mid-atlantic championship podcast with mike sempervivi and roman gomez is out right now reviewing the first episode of mid-atlantic wrestling tv from 1983 Hear it today at midatlanticpod.com or look for the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention of the latest episode of the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review with myself and Mike Mills out right now. Go to midsouthpod.com, also available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Hear the early days of Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express in Mid-South Wrestling, December 1983, the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review. Of course, I also want to mention Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, SUAWPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite shows. This week's guest, David Marquez. Hear that today. Once again, Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, SUAWPod.com. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! This is the second week in a row where there's a house guest wondering what the hell just happened in this house. But opening week Star Wars is out. Hear it today. Hear a fun talk about wrestling and baseball at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite shows. Look for the 605 Super Podcast. And now I'm feeling it again in my throat. The Mothership. I was about to say, see? Fuck. As Bobby Eaton used to say, fuck around, fuck around. Pretty soon you won't be around doing all that mothership stuff at me and your condition. You're a sick man, Brian Last. You're getting sicker all the time. Ugh. Time is drawing near. You don't have much left. What? I have lots left, I hope. I can I can tell. I can tell it by the sound of your voice. You're on the downhill slide or the uphill slide or whatever oh, it is. No. You're not doing any good. 